Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have some great guests and we have a fascinating subject and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We're going to put some acronyms together. We're going to talk about OER and we're going to talk about AI. OER stands for Open Education Resources and AI, of course, stands for Artificial Intelligence. We've been looking at both over our forum's nearly decade-long existence. For a long time, we've been looking at how institutions can create, support, use, and sustain open education resources, and we've been looking at the intersections between AI and higher education. Now we're going to bring all these together. The guests we have have co-authored a great, great paper about how we can apply the lessons learned in education from working on OER for a long time to what's happening with artificial intelligence. The paper, by the way, is really available. Look in the bottom left corner of your screen, you'll see a kind of tan colored box. Just press that button, it takes you to the paper right away. We have three authors, they're all great people, very, very different people, and I'm gonna bring them up on stage one by one. And then you can, we can start our conversation. Uh, so to begin with, let me bring up Anna Mills. <laughs> Good afternoon from the East Coast our West Coast friend in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. How are From you? San Francisco. Oh, excellent, excellent. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm very Good. excited to be here. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we're absolutely delighted that you can join us. Um, and, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you, we have a tradition here on the forum where we ask people to introduce themselves, not by describing what they have done, that's all great, but what are you going to be doing? What's the next year hold for you? So what are the projects? What are the uh, uh, ideas that are top of mind for you as you look ahead into 2024? Well, one thing I'm exploring is how we can share our rough ideas and experiences with teaching about and with AI. So um, collaborating and trying to bring together different efforts to, to create a space for that in higher mm -hmm. ed. Um, and the other thing is figuring out how to um, pilot with students um, an, a nonprofit app called myessayfeedback.ai. So looking oh. at a way to, you know, how do we provide enough guidance and guardrails so that we're encouraging a use of AI that sort of supports students developing their own voice, their own sense of critical mm. thinking, their mm. own experience with the writing process um, and critical perspective on AI at the same time. Um, oh, so playing with that app and seeing where that goes. Oh, I'd love to see that. That, yeah. that sounds really cool. And for, and for the first project, what kind of space are you thinking about? Uh, you know, an online venue or something like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, kind of building on what I did with the crowdsourced resource list, looking at what are some um, sort of very easy access, easy to contribute to and easy to search ways um, you know, and which organization would host that and how we collaborate among organizations um, so that it's really easy just to jot down some notes on here's what I tried with my students and here's how it went. Um, and then tag that according to discipline and, um, you know, pedagogical approach and, and all other kinds of tags. Um, that, that sounds fascinating. When, when you get something of that to share, please share it with us so that we can spread the word. Definitely. I will. Thank you. Very good. Very well. Well, hang on a second, and I want to make sure that we can uh, bring on board your co-authors. So stay tight, or sit tight, and we will bring up your colleague, Lance. Hang on a second. To misfire there, a little dramatically, going to bring him up there, right? And now, so Lance Eaton, welcome, sir. Hello. So happy to be here uh, with uh, obviously Anna and Maha, yourself, and all the wonderful folks here. Well, there's, there's two great things. One is that you're with College Unbound, which is an amazing, amazing institution. And the second is you have a beard. And of course that makes you, you know, privileged among, you know, all, all guests. Uh, where are you? Are you, are you in uh, Rhode Island with uh, College Unbound or are you elsewhere? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Rhode Island, Providence. Um, College Unbound is primarily in Providence, but we now have iterations in Philadelphia, Camden, Chicago, and we'll have like two more cities probably within the next year. Wow, Camden, what yep. a great idea. Oh, mm. wow. Well, um, and I love Providence, one of my favorite mm. towns. As an H.P. Lovecraft fan, I have to go there and look for tentacles and things. But, but I have to ask, what are you working on, Lance, for the next year? What are the big projects and the big topics for you? 
uh, and a few friends in the crowd know this. Finishing my dissertation is number one. Yes, uh, right. Yes. I'm I am close. I'm in the uh, finishing the analysis phase. Uh, outside of that, there's um, continuing some of the work I talked about in the article itself where there's a couple of the students that I'm actually working with and we're still I mean it's been months now we continue to meet like bi-weekly and are writing uh, some things based upon what we did around developing policies around generative AI um, so really working with them to hopefully get get um, some of those pieces out and also presenting with them they've done a couple of collaborative keynotes with me and one of them nice. is going to be with me on a leadership panel uh, at Educause this year. Uh, so looking for additional opportunities to really elevate their voice um, and then uh, more thinking about how how we like how we grapple with with generative AI like other people here, uh, particularly trying to reconcile like what is actually what's within our control and what is just kind of the larger cultural economic forces that, create the need to, you know the need or the the franticness to lean on these tools both for faculty and students mm -hmm. this is true this is well that last point is such a crucial topic which i think we'll be uh, touching on in the next hour um but I, I love the work that you're doing with your students that's fantastic mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, down the road a bit once you finished the dissertation and we can refer to you as dr eaton um Dr. DeBee Eaton, I would, I would love to uh, have, if you could, maybe we could do a forum session with some College Unbound students on Thousand. AI. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like that a lot. Well, welcome. I'm glad to see you here. Um, and we have one more. We're going to round out our troika, uh, and we can bring out um, one of our most popular uh, forum guests uh, coming to us from the most extreme uh, time zone, I think, of all of us right now. Uh, and this is our wonderful Maha Bali. Good evening, Maha. Hi. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, because that works for all well, time zones. It does. It does. Well, um, I'm so glad you can be here again. Um, we, we keep bringing you on as a guest, and every time you rock the house. Maha, we, we, a few weeks ago, I think you were on, and we asked you what you were working on, and it was roughly 100,000 things. <laughs> uh, and, and, and you had so many projects going on. Um, if, if I could, if I could ask you, uh, in terms of your academic work, you know, supporting faculty at American University mm -hmm. of Cairo, what are some of the big issues that are looming large right now as the semester starts? There's a lot of issues, uh, definitely mostly related to artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think there's also a lot of socio-emotional issues, a lot of burnout. And then the combination mm -hmm. of AI and having to respond to AI and people mm -hmm. being burnt out, not wanting to spend the time learning it because justifiably they're burned out. And at the same time, we're like, you just need to learn what's going on here so you can know what you need to do with your students. And of course, they're exhausted about this whole changing their assessments. And they're frustrated by us telling them, don't use the AI detectors because they're not accurate and it's going to be unfair to students. And yeah. it's this very difficult space of trying to be fair to students, but also trying to be fair to the faculty, trying to be there to support them. Um, mm. but the best way to support them is to ask them to learn it. And that's where's the time and the incentive going to come from. And I think especially of adjuncts who are hired late, paid less, have multiple other commitments. It's a really big ask. And um, we need to figure out what to do with this. And I feel especially for people who are teaching language at the early levels, where you can't mm. tell them integrate a little bit of AI they're not going to be able to meet their learning outcomes. They really need to teach these foundations and all of a sudden they have to do it differently. It's, it's a lot of pressure on them. And, you know, no matter what kind of ethical um, concerns we have about AI, ethical objections, uh, no matter how much we try to teach uh, critical AI literacy, explain to them about the biases and all that, the students are still not all mature enough to stay away from it when they need to, even when it's for their own good. Mm. Um, so we're all about trying to figure out how to make them use it and still learn um, or let them use it and still learn. So that's that's where I'm at on the academic side. But also really, really trying to get people to remember that in most things, unless you're teaching language or writing, the learning is not the writing. The writing is a representation. It's not we, we are learning and then we write to represent that. There's so many ways to keep representing it in different ways as well as the writing so that if AI is going to help with the writing, make sure that the actual thinking is happening outside of AI, 
make sure that you're having conversations, that yeah. kind of thing. Make sure they're having an authentic learning experience that they are writing about, in which case the AI won't be able to write it. And I'll tell you the crazy things later that I'm trying to do in my class to make sure that the AI can't do it. So, oh, which, uh, which class? So I teach a digital literacies and intercultural learning class. Oh, right, 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 right. So one right. of the things I told you about last time is that my students are going to go out and teach students in schools about AI and some of the other socio-emotional learning stuff that we learn in class. And then they're going to reflect on that. And there's no way ChatGPT knows what they did in the schools. So I hope those reflections will be authentic. And the other thing that is a very strange thing that I'm adding to my class this semester is we're going to adopt a little plot of land on campus, which is something I've been doing myself. I'm going to involve my students in it so that they're actually planting and following their plants and weeding and harvesting the plants, which you would uh, think has nothing to do with the class. But I'm going to make it have something to do with the class related to community building and socio-emotional well-being. But also, how can you use AI to help you identify what is a weed and what's not a weed and how do you use um, social media sure. to learn about planting and how do you use social media to let other people know about sustainable farming and to learn about these kinds of things. So I'm, I'm trying to make it work. And also the AI can't write about this, I hope. And I hope they get a good learning experience even if they end up using AI, you know? Well, it's a great project. I, I can't wait to see that. Uh, personally, I think that kind of biophilic design is just is just excellent uh, and, a, and, a, and a real win. Um, Ma, what did you just call it biophilic, like love yes. of nature? Does it mean love of nature? I'll put this in the chat. Ah, I like that. I'm going to teach them a new word on Monday. For uh, yeah, if it, there's uh, at least one uh, consulting business that just does biophilic design for education. Um, the uh, Icelandic musician Bjork is a huge fan of biophilic design. Really? Uh, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, the simple idea is just oh. including as much bio, you know, as much life into into design as possible. So, you know, plants, yeah. animals, nature. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm coming to you from a room right now, which is enclosed. Uh, it's an interior room, so it doesn't have any windows. Um, all I have is the built environment around me. So biophilic design would say, you know, introduce windows, uh, sounds, sounds of the outdoors, um, you know, colors, more green, for example. Um, I, I'm not doing enough justice. Um, Take a look, because I know you have plenty of time to research an entirely new topic. Um, all, all, all three of you have done all of us uh, a great service uh, with your with your uh, with your article about OER. And friends, if you're new to the forum, what I'm going to do is ask our our great guests just a couple of questions to get things rolling. But what I would like you to do is I'd like you to think about the questions and comments you'd like to put forward. So as our guests respond. And, and as you reflect on their responses, please think about the questions you'd like to ask. And again, please use the chat box. But best of all, either if you have something you want to say out loud, ready that click, you click that raised hand, or uh, put it in the Q and A box. Uh, so my my first question is is you know the open education movement. We can date this back maybe 20, 20 plus years. Uh, this is a long time of many, many educators of, of all kinds, librarians, faculty, technologists, and so on, doing lots and lots of research and also lots of production. Uh, we've had companies, nonprofits, and just tons and tons of open education content available in multiple media, multiple formats. That's a, I, I think it's a brilliant move to tap that body of knowledge uh, for thinking about AI. But what, what are a couple of the, the first connections that you made when you started drawing these two connections uh, together, these two bodies, the OER and AI? What are a couple of the first connections that occurred to you? Was it economic sustainability? Was it trying to uh, come up with the proper technology? Where, where did you start? And since there's three of you, um, one of you gets to jump in. Um, or if all of you fall silent, I'm going to pick on Lance. I'll say something really quick. Um, because Anna approached me first to start writing about this, and she had a particular angle, but we expanded that angle to not be about OER. It's about open education and open educational practices. Very so it's good. not about OER. The OER is like textbooks or open materials, but we're talking about open practices, as in the communities that we've been building for all these years that have supported mm -hmm. each other in there this moment of a shock of uncertainty where none of us knew anything. So there wasn't like an expert to go to that had a book. Well, there were, but you know, it wasn't enough. Hi, Brent, I see you. Um, but there are experts, right? But they weren't expert on this moment with mm -hmm. this technology, with that level of expansion, with that impact. And we all supported each other on social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of that. 
And so it was about the communities and the people and the processes of sharing with vulnerability because you're not sharing a ready-made book that's perfected and edited and everything. This is like, I have no idea how to cite AI. Shall I do it this way? Oh, no, that's not a good idea. You know, and being willing to do that. So that's, to me, that's the angle that I think is the key thing here is, yeah, go ahead, Anna. Please, thank you. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think that the, the big learning that I had in the process of working on this paper with Maha um, and Lance was that, you know, I had come to it from, I've written a textbook on writing that was OER and that was a revelation because I could adapt other people's materials and I could share my own and other people could adapt. And I worked with 14 collaborators. We were writing together and annotating and, and I'm continually adapting it based on student feedback. So there's this sense that it's, it's very rapid, organic, flexible, uh, and that potential, you know, could be applied to AI and was very much needed. Um, so part of it, I came to it just from like, oh, well, I could update my textbook and other people could do that using open licenses that facilitate this kind of collaboration and rapid response. Um, and then Maha made me realize that um, that was just sort of one piece of this bigger picture of, of an ethos of open educational practices that really was connected to these practices of digital collaboration that people became more familiar with during the pandemic, but that people like Maha and Lance had already been promoting the idea of a personal learning network and sharing on social media and through listservs and groups like, like this. Um, and that those two things were really connected and, and had an incredible synergy together. The, the open licenses, the, the OER idea, um, and the idea of involving students, the open pedagogy, um, really yeah. synergize yeah. with that kind of um, learning network through digital collaboration in higher ed. Um, and that those things come together to make this kind of really flexible um, and very positive um, form of response to AI um, that could give us some more hope, I think, <laughs> when we feel overwhelmed um, and we feel the uncertainty. Um, so yeah, that was my learning. Wow. So involving students um, as, as co-producers and co-creators, and then the communities of support uh, that we needed to make OER work or make open education work. Um, that's a good correction, Maha. And also that willingness to be open and vulnerable, to take risks, to make mistakes, to admit not being the 100% expert um, in this field. Um, that's a great set of overlaps. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. Please, Lance, go ahead. I mean, I'll just I'll just add that you know when Maha was like elevated it to that level of open end practices like that, I feel like that was such a clicking point for me, in that like there was just so much of my experience in working in doing instructional design, faculty development. Like it's often your departments of one or two. In mm -hmm. being able in, in, you know, over the last 12 years, developing that network of like other people are doing things, figuring things out. Like there's lots of great groups out there. There are a lot of great new groups that formed and just wanting to like, you know, I, I didn't want to be like, I didn't want to like, I didn't want to hold it in. I wanted other people to like take things and run with it. I wanted to make sure that like, it, and we all did like that there was iterations and also like people would do things and that, that iterated from us and then we would be re-inspired for other things. So like there's this wonderful like uh, feedback loops that also occur within all this. So the feedback loops between projects, between practitioners, between communities. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Oh, this is a terrific set of connections. Uh, and then it, one more aspect, which is openness with students, right? And we talk about this in our, you know, first of all, one very funny thing is the way I learned how to use ChatGPT in Egypt, which it should be blocked normally, you wouldn't be able to get it. It's uh -huh. from TikTok students by like school or university students explaining how to do, use VPN and pretend you have a number that's outside Egypt and so on to get in, not from people like my age. <laughs> so that's one funny thing. But Lance has done really amazing things uh, with students. So. One of one of my covert agendas in everything I do is whenever I meet with people, I try to give them something free that they can use. That's handy. So in today's meeting, Maha has just provided that. If you have issues with ChatGPT accessing it, there we go. Thank you. Um, 
Well, let, let me let me ask a, a, a second question, then, because because your responses to the first are just so great. Um, what what are some of the ways that uh, we can think about AI of all kinds as enterprises? Um, that is, as a college, a university, a public library, a system, as they respond as an entity. I, I was really struck, Lance, by your point about being a department of one. And you know, I know this feeling very well. Uh, I think many people who are involved in this conversation know that feeling of being just you know, one person making a decision, either in support or in practice or creation. But what if we learned from open education about how entire institutions respond as an enterprise and how that can apply to how we engage with artificial intelligence? I mean, I, this is, I'll say this is the, some of the concern challenge that I have is on the one hand, yes, it can be helpful to like reduce the load. And I think that's some of where this will come in, but I also see it as like, it does now, but in five years from now, now we're all needing to use AI doubly more, like they're doubly more to produce twice as, you know, to produce three times as much. Like, I think that's a thing I'm, I'm worried about as it gets to that enterprise level at organizations is yes, it will help us. And yet, like, when we start to take on bigger, ta because this will help us effectively finish or, or do tasks quicker or sooner, then the demand is for us to do more quicker and sooner. So, you know, the way I describe mm -hmm. it is like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, maybe you only had to do like, you know, that, that like quarterly report. And now it's going to be a weekly report, right? Like, because now they, you have these tools. And so there's a, there's a bigger demand on your work. And so we don't really... It, this is the thing. It, I, I worry about our system as it is because it won't solve for like making work less stressful because the new bar will just be set as you're doubly or triply more productive. Um, and that's like, I know it's not exactly answering your question, but it's it's the thing that I worry about is like, if we are already burnt out, we're already feeling all these things like... Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing anywhere where it's just like, oh, like this will mean we can slow down a little bit <laughs> or like <laughs> feel like or trust that that will happen. I feel like it will just be like, ooh, now you can do more. Um, so I said, nowhere, in history. That, but... <laughs> nowhere in history has that happened. You save time to make more stuff. Anne Marie Scott uh, was on this 10 minute, I think, was it 10 minute? A 10 minute interview with Tim Fongs. If someone can find the link to that on LinkedIn, it's a great interview. But she's saying, if we're going to use AI to do the crap that we don't want to do, maybe we should just stop doing that crap. <laughs> because you know what? If I can prompt AI to do what you're asking me to do, then you can prompt AI to do it for you. So mm -hmm. why are you asking? Why should I do it? You do it. You know, <laughs> like someone was telling me today that someone asked them to write a speech about something that they really didn't want to write anything about. So they gave it to some AI that's better than ChatGPT, whose name I forget right now. I think it's called Authorbot. Anyway. And it gave a good speech. And I'm like, great. So that person could have done that. Then they don't need you. Yeah. So what's the point? Yeah. So I'm, maybe I'm, nobody needs to hear that speech if nobody wants to write it. You know what I mean? Well, that's one model for working with AI. But but another would be the augmentation and sort of dialogue and using it to push our own thinking and to develop our own ideas. And that can be a gray, murky area between that uh, and letting it take over. But there, there could be ways to work with it that are not just um, where we have a sense of the intrinsic meaning of what we're doing, but we want a sounding board or we want something to speed up the formal aspects of the process. Um, and I mean, that's what I would want my students to use it for if they use it, right? Um, rather than just to um, automate something that's not meaningful. Um, but we've already seen that uh, academic professionals of all levels um, are ready to do that, um, that very thing. Um, that, and, that, and it might be something that we shouldn't uh, have to do. Um, but I, I, I think we, I think, Lance, you raise a crucial point. There's a, there's a principle from uh, social science called Jevons paradox, which is where when you make something more efficient or, um, or easier to use, people use more of it and it stops being so efficient. Um, so, you know, if you have a two lane road and you make it four lanes, well, you think this is great. There'll be more free space. Well, more people will drive and it fills up again. 
Um, so, you know, if we have the technology to make us more efficient, then we'll continue to be used, which brings us back to the questions of overwork and stress that you've, that you've been addressing. Um, well, please go ahead. So I, I, I am on that side. I think I do, I certainly agree with Anna as like, as a collaborator, like, like my partner, I see her use it in really great creative ways. For exactly that as a thought partner is trying to like think through things or like gather initial understandings around things uh, or topics she's exploring and the like. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of like the, that I feel is like the aspirational space I, I want to be in and really seeing and thinking about like the ways it, you know, in talking with my students, like there were some great ways that they made sense of it. And they were like, oh, this has been helpful. I, you know, I had this one student, she was great. She was just like, I took, I took chat GPT. I threw my notes into it to organize them. And she's like, and you know, people will be like, well, she should be able to organize her own notes. And like, she's, she's 30 plus years old. She understands who she is. And she's just like, I can, mm. like, I can try to do that or I can just do this and be further along in the process to get that paper done or, or things like that. So mm. like, I think there's, there's a lot of those types of wins that feel really exciting. Mm. Um, and I, like, I, I think that's part of why I wanted to do the course. And it's part of why, like, I continue to like be in conversation with students because mm. we can learn those things, um, and see how they get implemented in different places of work. Like, even for myself, and this is where I think about like helping faculty or institutions look at it, is like there are just some things that like, oh, that's so much easier. You know, the give the the the, the simplest thing that I like when talking to faculty about them, like we all have to do at the beginning of the semester, we've all done this probably in the last few weeks. We pull up the calendar and we toggle between the calendar and like writing the dates of every Tuesday or whatever days we're we're having class. Or you can just ask ChatGPT to generate that list. So, like, there's lots of those. Like, mm. I see it as a task minimizer. Like those things that like we need to do, and we can take it from ten minutes to like one minute. Um, mm. And I think there's lots of values offered at lots of different parts of institutions and organizations for that. You inspired me to also add something about like what kind of tasks can be equalized when we use AI. So one of the things, I don't know if I've said this before on the forum, but I'll say it again. Mm. If you use AI to help you summarize a reading, so Bing allows you to summarize a website or typeset.io, I think will allow you to upload um, a peer review paper or something and ask questions about it and it will answer them for you. And that is very useful for especially non-native speakers in that faculty in my institution, which is mostly in English, will give students sometimes readings that are jargony and above their reading level, and they're not willing to write, to give them something that's less. And the students are not gonna understand it better just because you're forcing them to read it. That's not gonna happen. Yeah. And so those things will make those readings more accessible to students without asking faculty to, to assign them different readings. And at the same time, it's not anywhere near the area of plagiarism, as long as you're not asking students to summarize for their assignment, which is a meaningless assignment, really, unless you're teaching them the, the actual task of summarizing. So then they understand the reading, and then they can actually have a good discussion with you. Hopefully, things like Bing and that kind of AI is not hallucinating in the way that ChatGPT does. I'm hoping. I've tried it on papers I've read, and it does help. And it helps me, too, as a, an academic. Right? I, I, I usually skim read. Maybe people will lose the ability to skim read, and maybe mm. they will lose out on some details that are important. Because Word used to have an auto summarize function that was like 80% good, you know, it would miss out some things. Yeah, but yeah. if you're not a good reader anyway, you're going to miss out some things when you're reading anyway. They might be different things than what the AI misses out on. But I think for non native speakers, this is the difference between reading it or not reading it at all. So if you get 50%, that's already, you've gotten somewhere, I think. And that matters. Maybe the, maybe this becomes a new process where people's first experience mm -hmm. with something is the AI summary of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they want to go back to it to really, you know, deep, dive more deeply into it, then they yeah. actually pick up a text. So. I mean, when I was doing my PhD, I would read the book reviews about a book before I read the book. Now, yeah. this is a more critical aspect of it that was also helped me be critical of the reading. But you know what I'm saying is like, we all have shortcuts that we use that are actually smart and not um, and help our learning. So it's about trying to find that space. <laughs> I'll, I'll add to that two things. One is like, even for, you mentioned, you know, non-native speakers, but even native speakers, like, I mean, it took me 10 years to read Foucault. 
history of sexuality. Like I might as well have learned French and try to learn it that like the only, <laughs> reason, I got, the only reason I got through it was an audio book. And yet if this tool was around, like it could have helped me so much more like in the class that I was actually taking it. Um, so I point, like I, I highlight that as a, like, that's a, that's a really good value added to this is like that being able to really find out because you're like if you're taking a class where Foucault is is that like in the conversation you know there's people in that class that like are in love and can read Foucault in 15 different languages and you're gonna feel like like a fool just to even ask like am I reading this right um that's my signal of like reading it upside down or whatever uh so there's that piece and then again back to the the teachers like the thing I like is like it can be the like infinite example generator right so like we love getting a student's paper that's a really good you know example and saying like hey can I use your paper for like I want to use it as a great example but we're never going to ask a student who writes a bad paper as an example of a bad paper like that's bad form but we can have like we can have this tool create these types of examples like a range of what might be good and bad examples for us to use to help the students understand like oh like what's you know what's a right way to do this and what's a way that probably isn't going to go well uh, so i think those are other ways at least within the like the teaching space that i find it really exciting interesting oh this is this is terrific i i'm i i i would ask you more questions but you were all so good and we have questions that have come in from the audience which is what we're really here for uh, so let me um let me just bring up the first one from uh kirsten helmer uh, and this is a really, really good question. It comes back to something we just started talking about here. Um, the, uh, would you say the ethos of open educational practices has always been challenging the idea of authorship and intellectual property? And now AI is pushing us to develop that further. Speaking of Foucault, though. Oh, my gosh. It's such a different way of doing that. I think with open education, because with open education, the person who creates the thing has chosen with their own agency to share it in very particular ways to make it available to others. And they've chosen how they, the Creative Commons licenses tell you how you want someone to use your work. So a lot of times I don't want my work to be used commercially because I don't want to provide things for free and then have someone else sell it, for example. But AI is, you know, one of the things, I, this is one of the things I really don't like is if we tell students to cite that they've used AI somewhere, they can do that. But I don't know where AI got it. AI is synthesizing stuff from all over the web. And I remember this very particular thing. I was asking it about white supremacy culture, and it said something. And there's a very particular author, Tema Okun, and her co-author, who wrote that. And I asked AI, so where'd you get that from? No idea. I'm an LLM. I have no idea. And I say, so who's the person who writes about white supremacy culture? Oh, yeah, Tema Okun but it won't directly tell you where it got anything from. Sometimes it's like synthesized from all over the web. So it's like intro psychology right. stuff. Of course, it's not one person, but something like that's very specific to that. So where, and so that's the problem. And of course, the way it affects uh, people like, you know, the visual AI and the effect on artists is, is truly problematic. And then, oh my God, the deep fakes with people's voices and singers and anybody being able to create a, a song with someone else's voice, like those things are, are really problematic and dangerous and can be used in very harmful ways and have been used in very harmful ways, right? And then I'm thinking about how am I going to teach fake news now going forward with all of this. So I've gone a lot, quite far away from the question, but because I think the ethos, which is it ethos? I always thought it was ethos of, um, <laughs> of open education and, and the authorship and making something open is completely different. There's, it's about permission and AI did everything without permission, right? So I think that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think we can, you know, it's it's not over when it comes to the question of AI and permission and labeling of data sets and who has the rights to the outputs um, and how transparent the algorithm is and all of that. And and so I think that we can we can take some lessons about that kind of transparency and labeling from the development of OER. Um, and, and hopefully push for that. I mean, that's really building on these fundamental academic values about citing our sources. Um, and that's, that's an open question for, for policy and, and democratic oversight of AI. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm a little more hopeful or I wanna have more hope about um, 
um, about being able to use AI and label when we've used it and have some and have some way to trace back, um, get more information about how it created the output um, and whether it had the rights to and all of that. I probably have the more, I'll go with extreme view on this. Um, and I, and I, I'll preface this with like my dissertation is focusing on academic piracy and how scholars make use of places like Sci-Hub and LibJet. Yeah, yeah. And I have a very, very challenging relationship with copyright and kind of how and where it exists today, um, where like we still can't get like there's stuff that's still not in the public domain from people that died six like Hemingway stuff. Not that I like I'm trying to hold him up, but as an example, yeah, yeah. it's still is still paywalled uh, more or less. And so like there's a way I see like the open education OER movement, open access movement, you know, was this like has been this like groundswell ground up approach to really trying to address that and trying to change that. And I like, I love it. I live it. I, all of the stuff that I do, I put into, you know, creative commons licenses. Even when I like do talks, I'll make sure the text gets up on my blog, which is creative commons license. So like I am fully there and I'm like, there's a part of me that is just, um, I keep wondering like, how do we fix this thing that feels like solidified in terms of the way copyright stands and what its original intention is. And there's a way I wonder if AI is going to blow it up in a mm. way that could, I, it, like I can see it going lots of different ways, but could it blow it up in a way that we're back to like rethinking it and maybe renegotiating what the terms are? Because it just feels so out of proportion of mm -hmm. like 70 years after the author dies and that's largely for the benefit of the companies, not the individuals or the family or of the, the creators. Um, so for me, there's like a, is this like, is this the thing that like breaks that um, in a way that's helpful? Outside of that, I will go back, you know, I 1000% I endorse or like have those same concerns that Maha brought up around like how it can be misused, how it can be exploiting lots of people mm -hmm. in lots of different ways. But like, there's also a part of me that's like, oh, I would love it if this shattered the, our contemporary approach to copyright. Well, the, it sounds like we're just helping you write your dissertation. Um, I, I, or, or we're making it worse. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope at least the former. Um, Kirsten, what a fantastic question. Uh, and, and the three of you have each taken different angles of, of approach on this. There's, there's a lot to it. Thank you, Kirsten. And thank you, the three of you. We, we have more questions coming in, which is just, as always, delightful. Um, and this is one that uh, goes back to the question of uh, sustainability, I think. This is Guy Wilson. What concerns do you have as educational tech companies add more generative AI features? Will this lead to less flexible approaches? Will it be just more of the same rigidity as we've seen from them? Well, my concern is whether they're building in critical AI literacy and labeling of AI text as, as they do that. Um, so are they prompting students, are they creating experiences for students to recognize the flaws in the AI if they're interacting with it? Are they directing students to learn about where is that output coming from and how might it be biased and how mm. might it violate copyright? Um, are they promoting interrogating the privacy policies around, you know, if they're interfacing with open AI, are they looking to have students understand where their data is going? Um, so those are some some questions I I would start with. Oh, um, really good questions. Yeah. Um, Maho or uh, Lance, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I, I mean, I have a general default skepticism of uh <laughs> ad tech companies just because of the like the ways they many again this is not all um but many of them you know offer up or, or you use student data you like use that as part of like the labor that the, or use student labor as part of the ways to improve or make the, the product more connective the ways that you know and i think about some of the the publishers who are now like ed tech companies who like it becomes an 
there's no cheap alternative um, to ebook or all the extra stuff that comes with it. Um, so like in general, I have that skepticism. So them rolling in AI makes me more concerned. And then the other piece is how much more those things get created that then get sell. I mean, and who was it? Um, forgetting the, the woman's last name, but first name was Taylor. She's done a couple, a good series, uh, in Chronicle of Higher Ed around like courseware. And my concern is around how much yeah. courseware increasingly takes away student agency or student and, and instructor agency as, um, it becomes required or becomes, you know, licensed or things like that. Um, so I know I'm more talking in general than specifically AI, but I just feel like AI will again up and like increased those concerns that I don't feel get well addressed in, in mm -hmm. higher ed. And sort of speaking of agency, will people be able to opt out? Cause a lot of this stuff, AI stuff is introduced in stealth mode <laughs> and you just find it there and nobody, gets to say they want to use it or not use it or recognize that it's even being used in the first place. So I think that's uh, that's an issue. I wonder why there aren't conversations at all, sort of. Uh, I mean, there are, but there isn't about ChatGPT and LLM specifically that I've seen around, is there ever going to be talk about more interpretability or sort of transparency? And we don't even know, right? We don't know which data sets it was trained on. We know some old stuff, how it was trained. We don't even know. and. Yeah, so I'm kind of like, why why isn't there more transparency on this? If more tech companies are using something we don't fully understand yet, or building on stuff that's already problematic in all these ways, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I also don't know what kind of climate impact this all has. So there's a few people who are talking about this, like Anne-Marie Scott, who you should have on here at some point, Brian. Um, and very few of us are talking, we don't know how bad the climate impact is of having trained AI. We don't know how bad it is every time it gets reused and every time the API is used. And I don't understand this stuff very well, but we should be concerned about climate. So we should be concerned about this thing that we say is inevitable and that we can't run away from and it's going to grow and all that. If, if we stop using plastic and then this thing, <laughs> you know, if we're working well on the plastic side and then this thing is coming and people are unaware of that kind of impact. Yeah, there's been very, very little <clears throat> connection between the two of them. Uh, so I, again, uh, so empowerment, opting out, uh, agency, critical thinking. Um, these are all huge, huge dimensions of this. Guy, I'm so glad you asked this question. Um, I'm so glad the three of you gave us a really good skeptical way of thinking about how this uh, may unfold. Uh, Oh, please, please go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I just wanted to add that yeah, I do think there's potential for, for building student agency, like the My Essay Feedback app that I'm consulting mm -hmm. on. Students, the idea is that instructors can write their own prompts for feedback and share those as public domain. And then there might be potential for students to um, write their own feedback prompts and then continue on that chat session so that there's a way that the software could enable a kind of a more organic and, and learner-centered interaction with ai oh that's perfect and it is like you are looking over my shoulder at the queue of questions because check out check out the next question we have this is from our good friend john hollenbeck doesn't the ai open the possibility for learners to take radical control of their learning uh, and so I, I guess, I mean, that's that's a question we can think of in general, but also to see how that connects to open education uh, and the aspects of student empowerment that you all discussed. I mean, yes, with a caveat, right, of like taking, yes, if it can be rel to the degree that it can be reliable. Mm -hmm. And I think... That's one of the the challenges is if you if you are not if you don't have some working knowledge of the area that you're exploring, it's not always clear that you're actually getting the right information, the the, the right knowledge and understanding. And so, yes, if we are training them to yeah, you know, if, if we are making sure they have the develop those critical AI literacy skills, I think it can do that. And I think that's part of, as I said about my partner, like I, I watch her use it in really smart ways. And like, she knows not to trust it and also like to elicit really complex thinking and ideas that like 
she is in conversation with. Um, I like part of what I like about it. And I've, I've said in some spaces is like, it can be a tool that like unlocks the hidden curriculum of the world. Um, mm. As I think about, you know, the, the example I always go to is the cover letter. You know, the mm. cover letter is the most BS piece of writing we all have to do the like, what right like what you have to, so much of the the rhetorics of that that thing has very little often to do with the job you are applying for but like there's all these like gestures you have to make in that cover letter so to me it's like wow you know having something to help you get through that um feels really great really powerful and like, yes, can help somebody learn of like, oh, this is this is if I'm going to tell my story in the role of applying for a job, like this is this is how that should look. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think about that both for like uh, multi-language learners. I think of it for people that are uh, neurodiverse. I think of it for people who just look at a blank page and want to cry um, that this gives lots of those spaces to and, and can be really powerful. Um, but I just I think there is that that challenge of no developing the skills to know where and when, then I think there's that conversation for, for increased learning and increased being able to like use that in lots of different spaces to, to build one, one's engagement with the world better. And from when we talk about tying it to education, like one thing I'm always thinking about is open educational or open pedagogical practices and really thinking about how, how making sure what we do in the classroom is something they can take with them outside, like outside the world or like the assignments have meaning beyond just like checking a box or like getting a point, but are yeah. applicable and usable elsewhere. So I see it mm -hmm. tied in well with that as well. I'm trying to compare this uh, concept of learning with and from AI with other things that we had before that gave learners a lot of agency over their learning, right? And you just mentioned open educational practices, right? So. What's the difference with me asking a question to ChatGPT or asking it publicly on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now, or Mastodon or wherever, right? Mm -hmm. So I might get the same answer from Lance and Anna's answer. Maybe I'll get an even longer answer from ChatGPT. Possibly if it's something that's been talked about a lot before, I'll probably find something meaningful from ChatGPT. But when I asked Anna or Lance, I actually made a connection with another human being and that connection becomes a relationship and there's so much more to it than the answer to the question. It's not an instrumental interaction. It's not just a technical Q&A. You could have asked that question on Reddit. You could have checked Wikipedia. You know, those are all different ways we were doing this. We could have checked the internet. The difference between the internet and Wikipedia and Anna or Lance is that I can check the credibility of Anna and Lance. Well, who are these people? Do they really know what they're talking about? I can check out what else they've said before. Yeah. Checking out what ChatGPT has said before doesn't really help me know its credibility. Wikipedia has editors now. We know it's okay as a first step for certain things, but it, it's marked when something is low quality, is missing references. We don't have that for ChatGPT. We don't know when it gives us an answer why it's so confident about this answer, or can it actually tell us? I'm not really sure, but that's maybe what you're looking for instead of just sounding so confident all the time, you know, that kind of thing. So for a learner who doesn't have the, the, the critical literacy yet, I think it's actually problematic because it sounds like they're talking to a person, but they aren't. And a lot of us, I think a lot of us who, it, it has a nice tone that makes you like it. Yes. <laughs> it's just problematic. You start to feel like you're talking to a human being, even though it's not. And you say, a lot of people say thank you to it. And a lot of people mm -hmm. say thank you to Siri, right? Yeah. So uh, there's... And I always think there's an element of focusing on learning as knowledge and not on the socio-emotional aspects of learning. And even if I know there's effective AI and a very good friend of mine is one of the leaders in effective AI. And I know it was developed for people with autism and probably it's helping people with autism. But I think for most of us who are not socially, who can build social relationships and in, in without the support of technology, I mean, using Twitter isn't a supportive technology per se. You know what I mean? I, I think learning is not about the knowledge or the exchange of information. Learning is a lot more than the exchange of information. Yeah, I, we, but how do we build in that sense of learning happens in relationship and relationship is key to learning with the, the possible uses that are exciting to students um, in education? Like how do we mm -hmm. allow those things to coexist and, and not take away and have AI not take away from relationship and learning? Mm -hmm. um, 
I yeah. wonder if, if it, maybe we can draw a lesson from the uh, literature around educational gaming. Uh, and one of the lessons is usually that games can be terrific pedagogical objects. They can really, really do a lot, but they really need an instructor to help make them actually really shine and to really work. Um, and maybe this is one of the roles for instructors is to really you know, help students engage with AI in a way that returns to them the socio the socio and emotional learning that I was talking about and the intercommunal relations that you're just talking about. I, I, I'm I'm we, we're almost out of time, uh, and we have so many questions coming in, and I want to I'm going to forward them the ones that we don't get to, to the three of you because they're really good. And I want to have a chance to ask us one last question because this one ties up to what you were just saying just a minute ago. Uh, and this is from uh, Joseph Robert Shaw. The most alarming uh, feature of AI uh, is the tendency to hallucinate facts that are not valid. What does open education plan to do to safeguard this? Of course, we are speaking on behalf of the entire open education community because we Absolutely. are the shining Absolutely. stars of open education and we all have one direction, universal. I have no idea what open education is planning to do about this. <laughs> That's a really tricky question. <laughs> but it, it, this has been a, a, an issue with uh, with open education. There's quality control, um, and there have been different ways mm -hmm. of doing it. Uh, you can think about Merlot with its rating system, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and then lots of conversations and trying to convince faculty to use OER in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, what, what kind of how do how do we apply that that heritage that practice to AI's lamentable problem of making stuff up? Well, I think what we need to do is, is is that critical AI literacy around how language models work. There's a fundamental structure there that creates plausible rather than true outputs. It's designed for plausibility, which lends itself to fabrication. I don't, I don't think they have a solution to that yet. There are some sort of workarounds, and um, you know, we can teach the workarounds and emphasize that. But I think. You know, we want to have students have that experience of seeing where it's making something up and seeing how it's disconnected from experience and reality and a search for truth that's still a very human process. That's how I see it. Um, uh, yeah, so many thoughts. I will try to keep them concise. Um, I, th I guess I would say within open education or there, there's something about the, like I want I want to call I want to call bullshit on like this idea of like the worries about data or about um, about quality control in open education being something that's like more of a problem there than elsewhere because we have also transparency and we have the ability to edit and update in a way that like there's all sorts of things in traditional publishing and producing of knowledge that we don't right. uh, like so i think there there's a there, there continues to be this like mi misalignment or mis uh maligning of of open Ooh. educational practices and you know i think the the piece about ai and and um it's it's hallucinating, which I don't like that term, but it's just presenting information that isn't accurate. Like it's part of the critical, you know, it's part of the critical um, AI literacy, but it's just in general, like literacy, like it's just like critical literacy of like, there's plenty of things from like non AI generated stuff that should be questioned and wondering about the truth of, and you know, my a good glaring example, and this it's a couple of years old, but like when you have textbooks in the United States that are framing uh, enslaved people as like, as immigrants that were, that came here, like that, yeah. like that to me, like people can say, well, it's technically true. And I'm like, it, it is not. Uh, <laughs> and so that like, I guess it's like that is something we always, always have to figure out and fight with. And we we had students presenting us with wrong information well before this. Mm -hmm. Like that's always like how many there's nobody here who's taught a course who hasn't had students present wrong information that they got from somewhere. And so I understand it. And yes, it feels like it's much more exponentially challenging, but it's mm -hmm. no different. Um, and I'll just go back to, you know, Autumn Keynes, who's a friend of several of us and, and wonderful thinker in this. And like, she just go, you know, her, one of her latest blog posts was like, 
you know, what's going to help us with this is good pedagogy, right? Like, like the same things that worked before generative AI are going to be the same things we should be leaning on as we're, we're in this. Mm, nice response. Nice response. Thank you. Thank you. Maha, I think you get the last word because we're, we're right at the end of the hour. Well, I was just, I was just typing in the chat. Awesome. Autumn, follow her for her great work on this. And it's Autumn with a double M. Yep. yep. And her thinking is very, she writes very clearly um, and, and very concisely. And she thinks in different ways that are worth all of us listening to what she has to say. And I also want to encourage people to follow Anne-Marie Scott on this. There's a lot of men talking about AI. Listen to the women and what they have to say, honestly. <laughs> And listen Indeed. to people who are outside the U.S. and what they have to say. They'll, they'll, they're looking at it in a different way. And one of the problems with AI is that it's been trained on flawed data that is also mainly from a white Western male perspective. And so, and yeah, so it's flawed because information is flawed and epistemically flawed. And, and as Lance was saying, also has a lot of problems with it. So it's just building on that and just doing it on another level. So. Well, that does bring us back to the question of transparency again. And uh, as you as you point out, Ma, the, the lack of transparency around black box AI versus the transparency that we see in open education. Uh, I, I, I hate to pause this right now, but we have blasted past the top of the hour. So we're going to have to pause and draw a curtain on this. Thank you, the three of you, for a fantastic conversation. So many great ideas, so many terrific points. Uh, how do we keep up with, uh, with all of you? Uh, what's the best way to find out more about you? I know, Maho, you're, you're on a whole series of media, of social media, from uh, Mastodon and Twitter, and your blog, of course. Um, yeah, it's easier on my blog, since we don't know what's going to happen with Twitter. <laughs> very good. <laughs> blog.mahabali.me. And uh, Lance, how do we find you? Uh, I have all my ramblings on my blog by anyothernerd.com. I'll throw Excellent. that in the chat. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, Anna, how about you? How do we how do we keep up with you on the West Coast? Um, I just put my Twitter and my LinkedIn in the chat. And, Very good. Uh, yeah. So. Well, and 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 I, I would first I would love to follow up with each of you on some of the different points here because this is this has been terrific. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for this very powerful article. And um, we hope to see all of you very soon and to follow up with each of your practices. Uh, Anna, please let us know when your two different projects go live so that we can uh, we can share them and learn more. And the same is true for all of you. Lance, good luck becoming Dr. Eden. And, uh, and Maha, good luck with everything you're doing. Now, friends, don't leave yet. I have to uh, show you where we're headed next. If you want to keep talking about these issues, everything from transparency to ed tech companies to agency to flaws in AI to what we can learn from the educational, uh, open educational experience, please keep the conversation going. Use the hashtag FTTE. You can hit me on Twitter there or on Mastodon. We'd be glad to hear more from you on this. Uh, if you'd like to go to our previous sessions, taking a look at AI and open and other topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive or uh, go to our website. In the meantime, if you want to go to our website, you can also find out what's coming up next. We have sessions on academic labor, sessions on AI, on how to meet unmet student needs. Again, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us for that. If you'd like to learn more about AI and you want to hear from me on this, just go to my Substack, aiandacademia.substack.com. And in the meantime, let me thank everybody for great questions. Really, really good thoughts. Much appreciated. As always, it's a real pleasure and a really productive delight to think through these issues with all of you. I hope you're all safe as the fall semester hurdles on. I hope you're all productive and well. Take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.